Today, we're gonna to talk about sons and daughters. When I say the word son or daughter, some ideas come to mind, right? Some of us think familiar relationships, some of us think identity, some of us think what is our posture and role that we play in an, env in an environment that we're in. And having spent a significant amount of time at Bethel Church in that environment, I was indoctrinated into believing that I was a son of God. And I don't mean that word in a negative way. I mean, I was indoctrinated for sure. And in the best way, I learned at Bethel the value and worth that I possess and the power that's in my being because I'm in God's image. What a gift. I'm so grateful for what I learned there and what was instilled in me. Teaching a bunch of people that they're sons and daughters and then treating them as such are two completely different matters. How the people behave, they might not be conducting themselves as sons or daughters, but then also the organization or the system responding to them, I actually don't think can treat them like sons and daughters. I have not, I have not seen an organization where a son or daughter is empowered and able to operate from that identity. Based on how institutions and organizations and systems are run, I don't think sons and daughters, I don't think they're able to function and operate as a son or as a daughter in a structure like that. Systems, institutions, and organizations are not wrong or bad. They're great, they're necessary. You can't be a son or a daughter in an organization. You can only be a son or a daughter in a family. So as you're going about living your life and living from that place, you need to be very clear about what it is that you're part of. Whether that's in your church, your place of work, a team you're a part of, your actual family, any kind of place where there are people with any sort of organization, you wanna be very clear. Are you part of an organization or are you part of a family? What is the ethos? What is the nature of this group of people? Being part of an organization isn't wrong or bad. It's when you think you're part of a family and you misjudge that you're actually part of an organization that you run into some very painful discrepancies. And if you continue to operate like a son or a daughter in an organization or an institution, you will eventually find yourself in exile. You will be asked to leave or cut off or rejected or whatever because the nature of the organization can't support or sustain something as free or as powerful or as autonomous as a son or a daughter. I run a small organization and we have trouble empowering each person as a son or daughter within even our structures. I'm not trying to throw stones at anybody, at any organization. I think this is a fundamental challenge that comes with the structures we've put in place on how we manage people. I've yet to witness an organization that empowers multiple people to be sons and daughters, let alone all of the people. I've never seen that before. I think we have got a lot of opportunity ahead of us. I think there's a lot of work to be done. And I do believe it's possible for us to have spaces where everyone is empowered as a son or daughter of the king of the world and we're able to collaborate. We're able to cooperate. We're able to work together. I don't want to bash on the institution of church, but I do want to look at that structure and ecosystem because I have had to work so hard to recover from how harmful some of the rhetoric and ideology that's practiced in that ecosystem is to a son or a daughter. In the religious sphere, there is such an emphasis on the outcome of people's choices. We have such a focus on manufactured fruit. The Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, that we exhibit symptoms of the presence of God in our lives, right? That, that God is dwelling in us and that looks like love and joy and peace and patience coming out of a human life. The religious system has come in and taken that idea that fruit's supposed to be popping out and we've put practices and protocols and standards and restrictions and requirements on people to get them to look like love, look like joy, look like peace in their behavior. This is manufactured fruit. It's not real. It's inauthentic. And it thus lacks the ability to release life. And the way that we get people to perform and adhere to these requirements is inadvertently through a shaming culture. Whether that was instituted on purpose or not, Christians are very well known for how shaming they can be, how judgmental, how exclusive, right? We look down on somebody because they didn't do something or because they did something they weren't supposed to or because they didn't do it in the right way or at the right time. There's a lot of pressure and shame that's going on in the judgment of each other when we fail to measure up to the standard we've agreed in our culture. That's what you're supposed to look like. That's how you're supposed to behave. That shaming culture sterilizes authentic exploration 
within the church. In church culture, we don't uphold genuineness, curiosity, authenticity. We uphold adherence, which ends up producing not sons and daughters, but conformists, spectators, pretenders. We end up producing an ecosystem and a culture that rewards right behavior and punishes wrong behavior irrespective of where it's coming from, regardless of the spirit of the thing. The problem with this is we know that God is interested in the other thing. He doesn't care what it looks like. He's more interested in where is it coming from? Why are you doing that? What was the motivation? What was the spirit of it? I've made some intentional choices in my, both my career path and my involvement in church systems with the sonship thing in mind. I've had moments, run-ins with leadership in conversations with powerful people who are holding a seat in a structure and they're upholding or protecting or maintaining a certain level of adherence. And then when a son or a daughter shows up under that jurisdiction, oftentimes the freedom that son or daughter is operating in threatens, challenges, fails to line up with what is expected of the results. And so then we have this clash and it's awkward and confusing, especially for the son or daughter in a system like that, that thought they were part of a family because this gatekeeper all of a sudden is starting to use pretty strong language and using spiritual principles and verses from the Bible and character and ethics, those things get brought into conversation to shame this person away from the behavior, to get them to feel bad, to get them to change their mind, to get them to back down. I know this sounds awful. I don't know that these gatekeepers are malicious people. I think that's what they know. I think that's what the culture has become. It's how you do a good job in one of those seats. Now, I don't wanna make sweeping statements here. This is not every pastor. This is not every church leader. This is not every spiritual authority figure. This is not all of them always. That's not true. However, it is a very pronounced commonplace practice within religious structures to address a son or daughter operating in freedom in a certain ecosystem with gaslighting, shaming, manipulative tactics to get them to behave. This practice is evil, doesn't belong in a space like that. Sons and daughters walk with their head held high. They look people in the eyes. They have no shame or fear about their experiences. They don't hide what's happening to them, what they're thinking about, what they're working through. Sons and daughters walk in the light. They don't shrink back from the authentic expression of who they are or what their story is. I wonder why we don't see sons and daughters running around in the church. I spent the last 30 years in church. I don't see a bunch of sons and daughters. I see well-behaved people. I see people who have taken really good notes. I see really good performers. I see people who know how to fall in line, know how to adapt to the culture. I don't see a ton of freedom, a ton of confidence, a ton of authentic expression or vulnerability as a way of life within that system. And this has to bother us. I mean, I, I'm sure it bothers us, it bothers me. This bothers church leaders, I'm sure. I don't think any of those people in their position are genuinely trying to create an ecosystem of performance. I don't think that's, at the end of the day, the bottom line for their heart. I think that's what they've come up with and have learned to embrace and accept because of the nature of the organization. This is no longer a family. It's not an organism. It is a structure. It is an institution. It's an organization. And because of the nature of the thing, people must be managed accordingly. So I've made choices to protest, to say, no, I will not bow to this. I will not reduce what I'm hearing from God in my life and the story that I'm walking out and the person that I've been called to be and the message that's coming out of that. As much as I've personally wrestled with and fought <laughs> that stuff coming out, I've had to say, no, I can't continue to adhere to this system and structure when the thing that's being sacrificed is the authentic voice of the Holy Spirit in my being. That is not acceptable. And to expect other people to do that is also not acceptable. Sons and daughters must be given permission and be invited into a family dynamic that allows them to be who and what they are. Freedom, authenticity, power. Imagine. If people were genuinely empowered on this level, to this degree, what would they come up with? What kind of things would we discover? Would it be messy? <laughs> I mean, it's gonna be messy regardless. It's messy now. But wouldn't we rather be in the mess of reaching for beautiful and profound and creative and gracious and loving and prolific than behaved? and predictable and in line and copy and paste duplication? 
my vote is for sons and daughters. I'm assuming that so is yours. Otherwise, what are you doing here? <laughs> so we've got to find a new way, forging ahead. We've got to hold the structures and systems that we've been subjected to accountable and demand that we do better. We've got to find better ways to creating culture and ecosystem and efficiency and prioritize relationship and the well-being of people and their lives over the results we want our organization to create. People are the priority of the kingdom. We've got to line up with that priority.